Vocabulary is the most obvious aspect of complex text to readers. The purple words in these texts are ones that are fairly rare. Vocabulary is also a feature of text that's closely associated with comprehension. In fact, the correlation between vocabulary and comprehension is almost perfect, 0.97 according to the most recent research. Now, the good news is that this very influential and visible aspect of complex text is also highly teachable. Teaching vocabulary makes a lot of sense, but teaching vocabulary doesn't mean teaching individual words. There are simply too many potentially unknown words in a text for teachers to teach all the words. For students to negotiate complex text well, they need to have a generative stance toward vocabulary. And by generative, I mean their ability to apply knowledge of how words work when encountering new words. Students need to be able to generate meanings of unknown words in text. And for this to happen, teachers need to employ instruction that makes critical features and functions of words visible to students. In this presentation, I'm going to describe a generative approach, both in how students use vocabulary and also on how teachers teach. To develop this approach, I'm going to describe seven facts about how vocabulary functions in English, and then I'm going to describe an instructional extension for each fact. The first fact is that human beings store their knowledge in text. Humans are the only species that have a record of ideas and knowledge gained over thousands of years living on Earth. Texts are the place where this knowledge is kept. Typically, the language of text is more sophisticated than that of oral language. A children's book, like A Very Hungry Caterpillar, can have up to two times the number of rare words that might be heard in a conversation between adults, even college-educated ones. Now, we have many forms of oral language that are also stored in current forms, such as DVDs and CDs, but most of these efforts began in a written form, such as scripts or plans. The vocabulary of text is typically more sophisticated than that used in most conversations. The second word fact is that English has a vast repository of words. We simply can't teach all the words. English has even more words than most languages because it's an amalgam of two primary languages. At the foundation is Anglo-Saxon, which is a Germanic language, and that was layered with French during the Norman conquest of England. These two languages were then embellished with words from Latin and Greek for technical scientific vocabulary. When we look at the unabridged Oxford English Dictionary, there are at least 600,000 words if we include archaic ones, and even more if we consider multiple meanings of words, such as bank in a river and bank in which we put our money. But the typical consensus is, is that there are about 300,000 fairly active words. If we were to teach all of these words, we'd have to have students come to school for about 100 years, and we'd be, have to be introducing the vocabulary at a rate of about 10 to 15 words a day. We can't do that, but we can teach students how words work. And once you know how words work, you can have some agency when you're introduced to new words. The third word fact is that a small group of words does the heavy lifting. As this slide demonstrates, there are approximately 4,000 simple word families, and by that I mean a group of words such as help, helping, helper, helped, but not helpful or helpless. These make up 90% of the words in most text students read. Then there's another 10% that gives the uniqueness to different kinds of text. And there are about 300,000 words, or about 88,000 word families in this group. Now, this role of the core vocabulary, that is, the 4,000 simple word families, applies even to the common core exemplars of complex text in Appendix B. 
As you can see from the slide, even at college and career ready, the percentages of the total words in text that are accounted for by the core vocabulary is high. But of course, that other extra percent of unique words is very, very critical to the meanings of the text. The fourth word fact is that words are part of families. We've talked about simple word families, but there are also complex word families. So in the first column, you're seeing both some of the simple inflected endings as well as complex endings, some suffixes. Next column, some prefixes as well as suffixes. And then we also see that there are compound words. Word families are very large. Once you get some proficiency in reading, that is the 4,000 words, most of the words we encounter beyond that group is a member of a word family with four to five members. The next word fact is that the words in the unique vocabulary, that is that 10% of the words, occur in networks. And the networks of the narrative content area texts are different. The networks in narrative texts are synonyms related to story elements. If you look on the left hand side of this table, you're seeing words that were used in a unit in a third grade core reading program. If we look at the words amazed, fascinated, and marveled, we have to remember that an author of high quality literature doesn't keep repeating those words over and over again. Instead of saying the character was amazed three or four times, the author could have described characters being spellbound, or if they were baffled, he could or she could describe them as confused or mystified. But what's important to remember is that most of these ideas in narratives are already known by students in terms of having a more simple word as a synonym. Now, when it comes to the networks of informational text, the words in the 10% are typically topical with interrelated concept clusters. Here's an example from a unit in designing mixtures in chemistry for grades four to five. We see prominent words, that is the words in the pink nodes. <clears throat> These words are related to one another. So to define dissolve, we need to talk about property. Furthermore, the words that are part of the networks of each of the nodes are words that flesh out or expand upon the ideas of one of the nodes. They're connected, but they aren't synonyms. And once we understand more about abrasive and acidic, we come to understand more about properties. The seventh word fact is that concrete words are learned and retained more readily than abstract ones. There are many times when a complex idea can be expressed in a picture rather than in definitions. So these are the seven word facts which have become the basis for generative word instruction. In generative word instruction, teachers make visible to students the dimensions of vocabulary that I've been describing. It doesn't mean defining words and giving students word lists, as this one from one of the exemplars from the Common Core that I identified on the internet illustrates. What we need to do is give students some idea of what to expect in text and as they start taking a generative approach, they can approach new texts and figure out new words in those texts. The first word strategy is that we want students to anticipate that complex texts are going to have many new words and that 
generative word knowledge is going to assist them in figuring out new words. Students need to be taught that they can't expect to know all of the words or have been taught all of the words. They're going to need to approach new text with the anticipation that they're going to encounter new words. Some of them are going to be names, as is illustrated in text. Others, they're going to be able to decode, as is illustrated by the word rusty. But still others, like exhibition and aviation, they're going to need to use the context and their knowledge of morphological word families to figure these words out. And I'm actually suggesting here giving students slides such as this one, um, charts where example texts with the challenging words are illustrated. The second generative word strategy connects to the second word fact, which is that there are many different words to teach. We need to expose our students to reading widely as well as reading deeply. And one way of achieving this is through magazine articles. Magazine articles are important because they introduce students to lots of different topics. And those topics are represented with unique words that students then begin to develop some background on. We know that people who have knowledge about a variety of topics do better on a new topic. Knowledge begets knowledge. And magazine articles are a good way to develop this breadth of knowledge. These are some examples from a program that we have at Text Project called FYI for Kids, which are available for free download. But they illustrate this development of breadth of knowledge and application of strategies so that you're developing bodies of vocabulary around key topics. A third generative strategy is to teach students that words can have multiple meanings. These can take on multiple parts of speech and also phrases and idioms. This is particularly the case with the 4,000 simple words. To help teachers and students with this concept, we've developed a program, again available for free download, called Exceptional Expressions for Everyday Events. Now, I'm not suggesting that third or fourth graders are going to be shown all of this information at one time. But the point here is that a word like talk has numerous meanings. There's a synonym structure that you begin to expect in narrative texts. We've also included connections to words in Spanish, which give you a sense of the complex academic vocabulary. In exceptional expressions, we give students opportunities to collect some of this information on their own through guidance from teachers. The fourth word strategy is that we want to teach students words and families, not just single words. Most words have inflected endings, prefixes, suffixes, and we can't forget that a prominent way in which new words are formed in English is through compound words. Especially when we invent something new like the internet, we do a lot of compounding to describe the new phenomena. Words such as software, hardware, website, and even compounding with abbreviations like email and ebook. In exceptional expressions, we give students opportunities to learn about compound words, inflected endings, and derivational words. And this is a form where students can apply their knowledge. The fifth word strategy is to teach students the rich networks of similar meaning words. Now, in the exceptional expressions, students have been getting a sense of these networks. But when we deal with particular texts, we also want to do activities specific to these texts. Good writers like E.B. White and Charlotte Webb don't write like Dick and Jane books, where certain words like said or run or like are repeated over and over. In Charlotte's Web, Fern's response to hearing that the runt of the litter is going to be killed is to shriek, yell, cry, and sob. A good author uses words with similar but nuanced meanings to communicate an idea. 
Now, in showing this slide, I'm not suggesting here that shrieked and commanded have the same meaning. I'm giving examples of communication words because there are also prominent categories. The words that writers of good literature use aren't just random words. They fall into prominent categories like emotions, movement, communication, and traits of characters and setting. The use of new vocabulary is different in typical informational text, which leads to our sixth generative strategy. In informational text, we're teaching students about relationships among concepts of critical topics. With a text like Tarantula Scientist, there are terms about the species of the tarantula that have to do with actions and body parts. The ideas are connected to one another. Defense mechanisms like barbed hairs, venom, and fangs serve to paralyze their victims. These words aren't synonyms, and the author will typically repeat a word like defense mechanism because they're using the words precisely, and there aren't synonyms for these words. The final generative strategy is to introduce critical new concepts with pictures and illustrations. The previous word map showed particular parts of a tarantula. A picture or illustration of these parts will go a long way to having students understand and get some facility with these words. At Text Project, we have a component called Word Pictures where we've been developing a vault of pictures to aid teachers in aiding students in getting some of the core concepts in social studies and science, and also some of the core concepts that writers of narrative use in describing their setting and context. In conclusion, I've presented seven word facts. Ideas are stored in text with vocabulary more sophisticated than in typical talk. There are many English words. A small group does the heavy lifting. Words are part of families. They're also part of networks. And those networks are different for narrative and informational text. And finally, concrete words are learned more quickly than abstract ones. For each of these, I've described a generative word strategy. I invite you to visit us at Text Project, where all of the materials that I've illustrated can be obtained for free download. And I also invite you to join us on our Pinterest site, where we have our vocabulary materials as well as other materials for classroom application. And finally, I invite you to revisit this information that I've talked about by reading an article on generative vocabulary that I've written with David Pearson. Thank you very, very much.